choose from and I can imagine that there were maybe some problems with overchoice but as I mentioned before you had the opportunity to hop from one topic to another in any case uh, on the EGP website you can find the recordings of the sessions as well on this platform after the council and of course there was also just a few minutes ago the group picture that was uh, taken uh, to support uh, the rule of law and the EU budget action I hope I truly hope that you participated in this action with uh, the paper with the hashtag don't give in um, it would be also very nice if you took a selfie with uh, the paper and the hashtag and mention it um, with the hashtag EGP32 and hashtag don't give in and uh, post it on all your socials that would be very uh, much appreciated for the next hour and a half ladies and gentlemen we will discuss the topic just transition Climate change has been a topic the Greens have fought for over many, many years. And finally, finally, things are changing and moving. There is the European Green Deal, the Just Transition Fund and a recently adopted climate law. But there is a very important consequence that should not be overlooked. It's mentioned also in the Sustainable Development Goals that nobody should be left behind in the transition process. And this is something that politicians and policymakers should bear in mind if they, for example, decide to phase out the coal mining industry. So I'm very much looking forward to the next discussion uh, with a panel of policymakers, experts and grassroots activists. And I leave you in the very capable hands of the moderator Jean Lambert. For 20 years she was MEP for the British Greens and last year she became a committee member of the European Greens. Mrs Lambert, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Francesca, and I'm really looking forward to this panel. As you say, we have some really excellent speakers with us. And what we want to do in this is to look at the current proposals from the European Union. How do we make them work in a way which reduces our climate emissions, moves us towards climate neutrality, and which works for workers and the communities which are most affected by many of the changes we want to make. And as you said, in Poland, as in a number of countries, it's the coal, it's the lignite sector, which is a particular focus of attention. And we'll address that amongst other things this afternoon. But with our panel, well, Chair's privilege, I have a number of questions I want to pose at the beginning. But please write your questions in the question and answer, and we'll pick up on some of them. Um, in this meeting. The speakers we have today, let me introduce them. First, uh, we have Bas Eckhardt, a former colleague of mine, still, he's still an MEP, Vice President of the Greens EFA Group in the European Parliament. He is a member of the Committee of the Environment, um, Public Health and Food Safety, and sits also on the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee and the Budget Committees. So he's very well placed to merge environment and money questions. We were due to be joined by minister from the new recently formed Belgian government, be the sixth EU um, country with Greens in government now, um, the minister, Madame Z Zakia Katabi, but she unfortunately is unwell, but we have been saved by uh, uh, spokesperson sitting in today, Yelabuna, who also has his own, um, you know, distinguished background in communications, having worked as a journalist with Médecins Sans Frontières before moving in to work at government level on communications and as a spokesperson. We're also really pleased to welcome Simona Fabiani, who's joining us from Italy and who works for CGIL, the Italian General Confederation of Labour, particularly on issues of climate and also sustainable development. And she has been part of the IT, the International Trades Union Confederation delegation to many of the climate um, big conferences over the years. And she serves on an Italian government working party on sustainable development linked to the Department of the Environment. So she brings us a great deal of experience. 
And we also have with us Milka Stepin from the Polish Greens, their former Secretary General, and she's a social and climate activist, and she chairs a citizens action group in the city of Konin. And she's been very involved in working on, a just, on just transition proposals for the region's Lignite industry. But before we hear from those panelists, however, let's turn for our first intervention, which is on video and comes from Jerzy Hupka. And Jerzy is a miner from the region of Silesia in Poland, and he's vice president of the Inter-Enterprise Trades Union. So he's someone who will be very directly affected by the policies that we are pushing for through Just Transition. We asked him about what a just transition for the mining industry would mean for the people of his area and how it might be done. As you can see, we filmed him professionally on site and in line with COVID restrictions in his area. He's speaking in Polish and there are English subtitles. So could we move please to our video from Jerzy? Proszę Państwa, do rozmów z organizacjami ekologicznymi zainspirował mnie mój przyjaciel Andrzej Chwiluk, który w poprzedniej kadencji był członkiem Europejskiego Komitetu Ekonomiczno-Społecznego, a zarazem przewodniczącym Rady Krajowej Związku Zawodowego Górników w Polsce. To właśnie Andrzej zorganizował szereg spotkań, sympozjów, konferencji, na których z ekologami i WWFM I dzięki tym organizacjom Greta Thunberg nawiązała z nami kontakt. Nawiązując do tych spotkań, chciałbym podkreślić, że na pierwszych spotkaniach wręcz iskrzyło. Krzyczeliśmy na siebie, lecz z biegiem czasu zaczęliśmy siebie nawzajem słuchać. Dlatego zdaję sobie sprawę z tego, że tylko bezpośredni kontakt i rozmowa daje możliwość i szansę na wzajemne zrozumienie a jednocześnie na wypracowanie pomysłów i różnych planów z korzyścią dla wszystkich. To mnie zmotywowało do działania. Zmotywowało mnie również spotkanie z Gretą Thunberg. I chcę powiedzieć, że Greta Thunberg nie musiała przyjechać do nas, a jednak przyjechała. Przekonałem się, że chciała poznać nasze tradycje, chciała się przekonać, jakie są nasze odczucia, a zarazem podejście do tak ważnych spraw środowiska. Chciałbym podkreślić, że Greta Thunberg ani razu nas nie atakowała. Wręcz przeciwnie, odniosłem wrażenie, że jest zatroskana naszym losem. Zobaczyłem w jej oczach zrozumienie i empatię. I choćby z tego powodu jestem niesłychanie wdzięczny Grecie i dziękuję jej bardzo. Jak można przekonać branżę górniczą do zmian? Moim zdaniem, żeby lepiej zrozumieć problem polskiego górnictwa, należy, trzeba nawet y, podzielić to na dwie kwestie. Inne zapatrywania są zarządzającym górnictwem, a inne zapatrywania są braci górniczej. Skupię się na górnikach. Choć zabrzmi to może kuriozalnie, lecz górnicy od lat byli manipulowani i wykorzystywani przez wszystkie rządy w naszym kraju, bez względu na opcje polityczne. Z ciężkiego znoju pracy górniczej korzystali decydenci polityczni. W blasku naszego święta górniczego dzielili się chwałą z naszego trudu. Warto wspomnieć, że już po wojnie górnicy pomagali odbudowywać Warszawę. Górnicy całe dekady wspomagali polską gospodarkę. Dzisiaj górnicy są traktowani jak zło, konieczne, jak zło konieczne. Tak nie powinno być. To boli. To bardzo boli. Mimo tego wszystkiego twierdzę, że górnicy chętnie się przebranżowią. Górnicy chętnie będą pracować przy odnawialnych źródłach energii, przy zielonych inwestycjach, pod warunkiem, że będzie się ich traktować podmiotowo. Jeżeli zapewni się im, zagwarantuje miejsca pracy z po podobną płacą, jaką otrzymywali dotychczas a zarazem pomocą na każdym etapie sprawiedliwej transformacji. Jak zbudować zaufanie wśród górników? Hmm. 
Moim zdaniem należy najpierw przełamać nieufność wśród górników, która tkwi w nich od lat. Dam przykład. Górnikom i ich rodzinom w miarę możliwości zależało i czy leży na sercu dbanie o środowisko. Budowali zielone parki rekreacyjne, choćby słynny park w Chorzowie. Budowali ogródki działkowe, których jest mnóstwo na Śląsku. Idąc dalej, budowali ośrodki wypoczynkowe i rehabilitacyjne w całym kraju. Dzięki pracy górniczej powstały szpitale, przedszkola, żłobki. Powstały osiedla mieszkaniowe, przychodnie lekarskie, a nawet ośrodki narciarskie z pełną infrastrukturą. Ten potężny majątek górniczy został górnikom odebrany. Nie z gwiny. Mało, powiem więcej. Etos pracy górniczej dzisiaj został odarty z godności. Tak nie powinno być. Dlatego moim zdaniem powinien być przygotowany taki mini plan marszala. I powtórzę to jeszcze raz. Zagwarantowanie miejsc pracy z podobnym zarobkiem, jaki otrzymywali dotychczas, lub wyrównującą rekompensatą. Górnicy powinni mieć na każdym etapie pomoc i zabezpieczenie w czasie tej sprawiedliwej transformacji. Z górnikami trzeba rozmawiać uczciwie i szerokim gronie. Mam na myśli również powołanie rad pracowniczych wśród załog górniczych, ponieważ, przykro mi to mówić, ale wielu działaczy związkowych dzisiaj nie spełnia oczekiwań górników. Delikatnie mówiąc, powinny powstać plany, programy dalekosiężne z korzyścią dla wszystkich, również środowisk lokalnych. Górnicy powinni być współuczestnikami tego procesu. Jednocześnie chciałbym wspomnieć, że należy jednak powołać strukturę, instytucję nową, która będzie nadzorowała te zmiany. Ponieważ jestem przekonany, że każdy rząd do tej pory reprezentował tylko i wyłącznie swoje cele polityczne. Okay, well, I gather that the uh, video is finished. Unfortunately, we as the speakers couldn't see it, but I hope that um, those of you who could you appreciated the very powerful points that were being made there about the process of change as well as the outcome. And where Yerge talks, sorry, I'm told it's still on. No. Okay. No, I'm sorry. I slight technical hiccups there. So, um, but where Yage talks about how the miners want to be the subjects, not the objects of this transition. So therefore, to be really engaged, and we'll come back to some of those points later on. But I wanted to start with a, a question to Bas. Um, which is a, a bit of context, I suppose, Bas, about what is on the table. So what is the Commission putting forward in its Green New Deal and Just Transition proposals? And is this a serious set of proposals, do you think, or is it greenwashing? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Jean, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, great to be sort of here uh, and and uh, happy to provide a bit of that context as far as possible. Um, regarding your question, Jean, um, maybe just to start off right away, I, I sincerely think that, that the European Commission, when they launched the Green Deal, and this is now exactly a year ago, uh, the new Commission started on the 1st of December 2019, so one year ago, and their first first big communication was the Green Deal where they were really putting an emphasis on that we need to change our economy uh, and right from the start also that this will be a challenge and that it will be important that in this transition, no one is left behind. And I, I sincerely think that this is something that the commission uh, wants to take serious. But of course, the big question is, 
when it goes into this, this European compromising machine and a lot of things change on it, and then at the end, what comes out of it, is it still a serious way? And I, I think that's, that's, that's probably going to be one of the key questions. And, and why am I asking this question? Because by asking it, you can, you can already imagine that I'm somewhat skeptical on some of the developments. Um, first of all, when this proposal was published in January 2020, so it is, was one of the proposals that the Commission put out, um, immediately you had a setting where the different member states were fighting over getting an even share of that piece of money. Whereas if you are serious and seriously looking at just transition, I think everyone realizes that there are huge differences between Europe and there are different needs. But if then on top of that, even a country like Germany claims a piece of the pie for just transition, I'm not saying that also not in Germany you have quite a substantial a need for change in some of the regions, but you can wonder whether a country like Germany, or for that matter my country, the Netherlands, really is in need for European money there. So there already you see the kind of where it starts with the idea of leave no one behind. It very quickly gets into a kind of a horse training of countries, everyone fighting over their peace. Secondly, what is of course for us very important is if you do a just transition, then at least the region that you think the money should go to should be in a serious transition. So, for example, uh, we are talking quite, quite a lot about coal when we are talking about just transition. By the way, I think it's important to realize that this fund should be there for a much longer period. And we're not only talking about coal, but I think in the first instance, it's, it's logical that we are thinking of coal regions because that's where the transition is, is needed the first. Um, when you are uh, talking about regions that, that uh, should get money from a just transition fund, of course, what should be then the, the core uh, starting point is that that region commits to a coal phase out. And then you can also get that just transition. Well, that is not always 100% clear either. So this is one of the problems that we have as a Greens, that of course, when you are identifying regions who should get it, there should be a very serious transition plan behind. Um, the third element, which is still of a, a tricky one, is what you also see is when there is a new fund, a lot of players jump on that fund and would like to have their bid on it as well. And for example, we are now seeing that in the European Parliament, for example, when initially, what is the idea of just transition? Leave no one behind. This is money that should go to the regions. This is money that should go to the employees. This is money that should be used for reskilling, for really looking at how you can get to other jobs. This is money that should be invested in the social infrastructure of these regions. That's, that's the entire idea. But what you see now is that, for example, the gas lobby sees a potential of getting money out of the just transition because gas is better than coal. And you get into a kind of a classic European fight over money and the same old industry fighting over that money again. And at the end, you wonder how much money will really end up at the people. And this is not just another fund that ends up in the industry that then so-called needs to be developed in that region, which we agree with. But if only that money goes to that industry and in the end, who knows uh, what, what will end up at the former employees, that is still one of those big battles for the implementation. So, yes, a sincere start, uh, but both councils or member states, but also we have to be frank here, the European Parliament, who indeed included gas as a kind of a beneficiary of the just transition. That was not in the initial proposal, but the European Parliament has in its position that that should be possible. So you see there that the lawmakers, both at the member state side and in the European Parliament side, are slowing it down, weakening it, uh, and, and watering it down, basically. And the initial idea in that sense is, is, is slowly drifting away. And I think that is really one of the key concerns that we are having because it's crucial for this transition. But of course, then let's make sure that it happens in the right way. And, and I wouldn't call it greenwashing, Gene, to conclude. That's maybe too strong, but serious concerns we absolutely have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So that's setting some of the issues on the, the table at the start. 
Simona, can I come to you and ask, you know, how important is this whole issue of the Green Deal and just transition for the trade union movement in the European Union? Because a lot of the first ideas for this were coming from the international trade union level. So is it serious for, you know, do you think this is a serious proposal? Yes, uh, thank you, Jane, and uh, hello to everybody. I'm so excited to be here with you and um, uh, answering to your uh, question. Uh, yes, um, Green Deal and Just Transition Mechanism is uh, very important for trade union movement. We agree with the, the principle and the, with the goals of uh, Green Deal and uh, we share also a lot of the, the strategy put uh, in the table by the European Commission, I think, uh, of um, uh, biodiversity strategy, uh, farm to fork strategy, uh, climate law and, and so on. But uh, uh, we share the principle I saw, but we are we have to be sure that uh, that goal will be done. So uh, it's not so easy. There are a lot of problem. Uh, one problem is that uh, uh, this uh, this de green deal uh, write a radical and deeply uh, transformation of all our society and uh, our economy and so uh, needs a lot of uh, investment. Uh, we would be sure that uh, money go only to the projects that are in line with the climate action and with the environmental protection and we are not sure of that at this moment and then also the money is not enough and uh, also uh, about the just transition mechanism there are some limits because um, the priority of the mechanism is for the region that are deeply um, linked to fossil fuel, in particular coal and lignite. But uh, the kind of transformation we have in mind is uh, not only decarbonization, but uh, uh, sustainable development that change everything. So all sectors of the economy are engaged, I think, of uh, agriculture, I think of uh, um, um, uh, energy intensive uh, industries, I think of automotive, if we want to, uh, to, to have a sustainable mobility, we have to think of more collective uh, transport and less um, private mo 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 mobility. So there is a, a, all sector are engaged in the transformation, and so we have to we need uh, a just transition that uh, can ensure uh, worker not only in the coal sector but in all the sector of the economy. Uh, so I think that uh, a lot of other things uh, are to to be done. Uh, at both at the European level, but uh, also state have uh, a great responsibility because uh, Green Deal is uh, an hope for the future, for our future, but uh, we have to be really, really strong to, to respect. So I think, you know, part of the, the situation then is we're looking at a, a whole system approach and just transition needs to, to fit with that. But um, yeah, look, if I could come to you, do you think there's a risk that the COVID crisis is going to push, push this off course? you know, that we saw back in 2008 with the financial crisis, that at the beginning there were some really promising sort of steps to, towards 
a, a sort of greener future in terms of energy efficiency, looking at, you, you know, sort of greater domestic, um, greater energy independence, but it very soon went back to business as usual. So do you think there's a risk of that happening now with the COVID crisis? Is that how the government, your minister, sees it? Well, first of all, on behalf of, of Zakia Katabi, of course, I'd like to apologize. She lost her voice completely, so and since I'm the spokesperson, I will speak out her words, but I won't engage into the debate, so I thank you for your comprehension. Uh, but yes, um, well, actually, while some people see post-COVID management as an opportunity to go on with their business as usual, we see it as a lever to move forward, actually, on the transitional agenda. So, indeed, a number of lessons can be learned from this crisis. Um, we've been confronted with the limits of our globalized economic economic model. And, for example, the shortage of the masks um, was a good example. But also the loss of biodiversity uh, is pointed out as an accelerator in the appearance of these uh, viruses, different viruses. So also the first victims and those most affected by COVID, as we all know, are the same as uh, those of climate change. Uh, these are the most fragile and precarious people among us. So the possible solutions to this crisis echo actually what we ecologists already advocate for as relocation and resilience of our economies. And it's also the fact that social and environmental justice are inseparable, actually. So on this basis, the recovery and resilience plan should allow us to plan a sort of re-industrialization project on a European scale. Um, at least as far as our vital, as the vital functions go, and these are concerns here, that's like healthcare uh, products, uh, the foods, clothing. Um, so we need to invest in the shortest possible and realistic circuits. Thank you. And, the, you know, done right, this can, you know, it can sort of interlock. And within this, the, the, all the proposals going on with the EU budget and so on at the moment, bus, there's a requirement, you know, to spend sort of 30% on sort of tackling climate change and, and so on. How is all this going to be ensured? You know, what are the conditionalities here? And there's a lot of money there in recovery, you know, bail out this industry, bail out that industry. You know, are we just propping up the problems or, you know, are there real conditionalities? No, good <laughs> Thanks for the question, Jean. Uh, maybe just first to, to I, if you allow me, I, I jump a bit to uh, where the corona is putting us off track, uh, as Jelle said. Um, I think it is interesting to see that at the European level, for the first time ever, there is now a discussion of a serious European investment plan. I mean, that has never really been there before. And even a country like the Netherlands, where I come from, and uh, apologies for my government for that, but they have a kind of a consistent position that as soon as it's about money and Europe and put the two together, they get very nervous. Um, but even the Netherlands agreed in July that this crisis shows us that we need to get an investment together into it. It was hard work. Of course, there was a lot of uh, debate about how much that should be. So it got smaller again. And by the way, that's why, for example, also the Just Transition Fund got smaller so there you see that that's part of that is also uh, a typical European debate. But I do think it is important to realize that now for the first time ever, we have a serious European investment plan where also seriously the aim is to invest that in the new priorities of the European Union and of us all, I would say, being the Green Deal and digitalization. So I think there you can see that Corona, all the negative aspects that we are seeing there is also some learning going on with our heads of state. And, and, you know, we should embrace that and celebrate that because it doesn't happen that often. Um, then back to your question, Jean. And of course, you're absolutely right. Part of that package deal in July was also quite positive that the heads of state said, well, of this entire package of the EU budget and this recovery package, 
30% should go to climate. So 30% should be invested in uh, the Green Deal. Uh, by the way, as a European Parliament, we now ensured that it's also climate and biodiversity because that's always a bit of a problem if you ask a average uh, heads of state and you ask in Green Deal, they will say it's climate, whereas we know there are a couple of more challenges than just climate change. And, and, and fortunately, we managed in the parliament to broaden that scope slightly. Uh, but still, uh, 30%, uh, that's the overall agreement, should go to climate. And then, of course, your question is, is very valid. Um, okay, 30%, uh, but what does that mean? And I think we are in the middle of that discussion as we speak still. Um, what do we mean by this 30%? And of course, the uh, kind of the, the, the default attitude of also here the Commission is to use tracking methods they have been developed for years now, which have been criticized because, for example, a big part of the EU budget when it goes to climate, then the Commission is always coming to, well, that's our agriculture budget because that goes to environment, so that's climate. You know, these kind of, I mean, it's a bit more sophisticated, but basically there's this kind of reasoning behind. So we have been always very critical on, on what are you counting as a climate investment? And we got a lot of support. Also, if you just, I would say, Google Court of Auditors and Climate, and you will run into many critical reports. So it's not only the Greens, because you can, of course, dismiss green criticism, like ah, they always claim it's greenwashing. But it's even a serious uh, institution like Court of Auditors making that point very clearly that if Europe keeps on having its current way of calculating what they mean with greening, then, then these percentages are on paper 30%, but in reality are not changing our economy and changing towards a climate neutral uh, economy. And, and therefore, we are now in the middle of a battle on, on how to improve also that tracking methodology in order to really have greening on the floor and not only on paper. But as I said, the jury is still out, Gene, so bear with us. This is still an ongoing fight, but, but we do feel that there is a bit more support also now coming from the Commission, because if they claim that these are new priorities and this is, uh, they call it the next generation, well, if you then use the tracking uh, methodologies from 10 years ago, I think even the Commission realizes that next generation might be a bit of a difficult uh, uh, frame. So, work in progress. Yeah, always work in progress. And but Milka, where, where you're looking at the, the, the Polish government and you, you know spending a percentage of money on climate with, as Bas has pointed out not the best mechanisms for tracking anyway. How do you, how prepared do you think the Polish government is for channeling money towards spending on climate and biodiversity measures? Ah, uh, that's a very difficult question, actually. <laughs> So um, as uh, Bas has been apologizing for the uh, Dutch government, I think uh, um, uh, I as a Polish Green would have to apologize for uh, the Polish government with which I have nothing in common, but unfortunately they are from my own country. Um, it's um, since I work mostly on the ground, uh, I'm, um, I work within a region that is a lignite mining region currently in the just transition process, um, we have to observe both what's going on on the European level on, and on the Polish level, uh, because uh, uh, what happens at that level influences uh, what money we will be getting, what processes we need to go through, and the planning that we're doing. Um, so um, as maybe some good information uh, at the beginning of, uh, of what, I'm, uh, what I'm talking about, um, uh, my region, the Wielkopolska Wschodnia or Eastern uh, Greater Poland, uh, will be putting in a plan in, uh, to, the, to the European Commission uh, in which it will be um, committing to climate neutrality by 2040. Uh, so this is probably one of the most ambitious plans so far in Poland. Uh, to remind you, there are at least uh, six coal regions in Poland, uh, two of which are lignite mining regions, the rest is black coal. 
Um, this is a lignite mining region, one of the smaller ones. Uh, but because it is smaller, um, we have managed to get to the point within the last three years where uh, we're sort of the, the pioneering uh, region at the moment of the just transition in Poland. Um, and one of the major issues has been observing how um, our money keeps getting cut <laughs> or how the percentages are being changed. Um, which is dependent on two aspects. So one of the aspects is uh, what Bas was talking about on the European level, um, the movement backwards and forwards of how much money will be given to the various regions. And the other thing is, of course, um, the Polish government's um, inability to um, give a climate goal or to uh, give a commitment to a climate goal. Um, at the same time, one of the things I would like to note is that um, I think Poland is uh, going to be something like uh, the USA, where at the national level, uh, we don't have commitment to uh, going away from coal, while on the regional level, most of the regional governments uh, are at the moment going through transition processes. Um, I've taken part in the last three months in a number of uh, meetings of various groups that are preparing plans for uh, the coal phase out. So um, this situation has actually been uh, sped up by the fact that there is a just transition fund. Uh, there is awareness that this is not enough to conduct the just transition, but we are in, in the midst of uh, creating plans. Um, and uh, one of the things uh, that I would like to be taken ac in, into account on the European level is to maybe take into account that the regions are much the, the regional parts of uh, a country might actually be uh, more prepared to go towards climate neutrality than on the national level. And I don't know exactly how to work that in because of this is this is, of course, very complicated. Um, but if you have a region like mine, which has um, I think the most ambitious goal in the Polish um, uh, in, in Poland, um, it would be a shame that, you know, its uh, budget is cut because the Polish government is not on board with that. Uh, at the same time, um, it has another danger, I would say, uh, because there has been an increased in interest on the um, national level uh, in the Just Transition Fund, in the Green Deal and the money that would uh, be coming out of that, there is a lot of danger that um, uh, some of that money, there will be attempts to cent centralize the, that money and use it specifically for, um, for example, modernizing the energy, um, the energy network in Poland or for helping the big uh, industries, the national companies, energy companies uh, to modernize or to switch, for example, to gas or to nuclear, because, of course, our uh, plan, the current Polish government's plan uh, involves six uh, nuclear, nuclear power plants by 2060, I think, um, which, of course, is very difficult in terms of economy. Uh, so one of the big things that we as activists on the ground level are noting is that this is a huge danger. Um, and that this needs to be addressed specifically in the requirements for Just Transition Fund and for other funds that will be aimed at helping areas like, uh, like mine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And if we can move to, to Italy, Simona, I mean, how prepared is the Italian government to really move towards reducing its climate emissions, spending this... 30% on genuine, um, you, you know, projects and to deal with climate change and biodiversity? Or are you maybe a bit like Poland, where some of the regions, you know, are moving ahead and the government still is not sure what it's, it's doing? I, I, I really don't know because... Um... Uh, trade union uh, in Italy have uh, um, asked uh, to the government to open a discussion with uh, us to, um, to, to um, discuss about uh, what uh, we can uh, uh, put inside our recovery plan on uh, how the uh, use the, the the resources of uh, next generation EU, but the government at the moment has not uh, given us the opportunity to discuss about this. 
So I can say uh, what uh, is my opinion. I have uh, some doubt that the uh, government is uh, ready to planning uh, this uh, radical change because uh, Italy has not at the moment uh, a strategy, a long-term strategy for the decarbonization. Our um, energy and climate uh, plan is not uh, review in the in the light to raise the ambition in line with the, the new target of uh, European uh, uh, Green Deal. We have no a plan of uh, adaptation on climate change. And uh, we have no, no plan, not measure, and not uh, a, a democratic process to discuss about just transition. So I don't know what can be the, the project and the reforms that our government can put inside uh, the recovery plan if there is, there is not a planning uh, about a strategy uh, of what uh, would be the change, in the transformation in uh, in our country, and um, uh, I would like to say also that uh, a lot of money are, are already be spent because of the uh, recovery to the climate uh, to the COVID crisis. So there have been a lot of uh, law in Italy to restore enterprises um, that are facing the, the crisis, the economic crisis consequences to the COVID. And uh, this uh, a lot of money would be used with the conditionality. So uh, we, they, the government could put some conditionality uh, to the enterprises to give them money if they uh, keep uh, seriously reconver ecological reconversion of production or decarbonization. But this is not uh, what uh, they are done. So all this money are spent without uh, conditionality. And so uh, this make possible that uh, business as usual uh, go on. And the other issues uh, also, I think Bas speak about this, is uh, what could be uh, considered also decarbonization. Uh, we, we are discussing in Italy about uh, um, capture uh, of cap capture air storage. Uh, this is not for 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 um, for my trade union. Is not this uh, the solution? We think that uh, we would invest in uh, renewable energy, efficiency energy, uh, the protection of uh, uh, ecosystem and restore of ecosystem. Uh, we we have. Uh, um, uh, give a document of the of, of uh, our Italian Parliament when we uh, say what our uh, our priority for the recovery plan, and we have uh, only five points. So I can send, say to you there are uh, um, um, health instruction, decarbonization, and protection of, of the environment. Uh, sustainable jobs and infrastructure for digitalization. This is our, our priority, but uh, I don't know at the moment uh, the priority of the government. And I think the next few days they will present uh, the project and uh, we hope to can open a, a discussion, a democratic uh, discussion in our country, but I don't know if uh, there there will be this opportunity. This is, when you think that, you know, Italy is supposed to be, would have been hosting COP26 this year, you, you know, and sort of the British government has, even the British government has made steps because that, you know, it's now taking place in the UK, albeit next year. I think, you know, there are so many lost opportunities, aren't there? But if I can come maybe to Belgium, I mean, you know, we've heard people sort of apologise for their governments and whatever, and then Greens look at Belgium and we think, oh, we have, 
at least Greens are in government now, admittedly, very recently. But, you know, are things looking better there? We, have, we, we, we will have expectations. So, you know, but what are the realities for, for Belgium when it's trying to make the, these sort of changes and really move forward? on you know, the funding conditionalities, the spending the 30%, et cetera. Is there, is there hope in Belgium? Well, first of all, I'm happy that Belgian politics makes some people happy, apparently. Um, first of all, Ms., uh, Mr. Katowicz, I would try to live up uh, to the high expectations of all European Greens. Uh, the stakes are high, uh, but we are very ambitious. Now, we must say, as said before by Jean, um, we are blessed in Belgium with having five green ministers at the federal level uh, with the different uh, green core competences like energy, mobility, and uh, Zakia's own competences, so our competences, uh, climate, sustainable development, environment, and green deal. So we are blessed. Um, on the other hand, this is, of course, Belgium. We have uh, different coalitions in both federal and regional governments. So you, making a political compromise in Belgium is a sort of a national sport, actually. And um, even one of the techniques to make such a compromise is called the waffle technique. I kid you not. But on a more serious note, um, our national government is quite green, of course, and ambitious even though we depend on the ambitions of regional governments as well. So that's uh, not at stake. Um, now, when our federal government took office, it was only the 1st of October now, uh, they started drafting a national recovery and resilience plan uh, that has to be submitted to the European Commission. Um, so uh, Zakia, as a minister with competence called Green Deal, was actually able to influence already the methodology designed for this process. So um, there was already a very first good thing. She herself is also represented in the political steering committee and different advisors uh, of our cabinet of our office uh, represent, represent her in the different uh, high level working groups. Now, um, apart from this ambitious federal government plan, um, it's got to be, uh, considers their best political ally, actually, um, or it remains European level and the ambition stated by the Commission. Um, so today she's not longer only referring to the political program of the Greens, but she also is referring to the European roadmap, uh, the principles of do no harm, do not roll back and leave no one behind, offer um, offer guarantees that actually that the Minister Katabi could probably not have imposed herself at our national level. So um, in Belgium, we only just got started. So we are very hopeful. There's a lot of potential and we are really ambitious and uh, we're sure. Uh, but the poor of the pitting of the pudding is in eating as always. Thank you. Interesting to see that, you know, for governments that want to go further, you know, or, or that are more ambitious, the European level is actually providing a pull mechanism. So if we've got that and a push coming from the regions, then the two together can have a, a real influence on, on government. I wanted to pick up a question that, that's come in um, from Richard Balters which is when we're looking at sort of just transition and moving from one industry to another, and we talk a lot about the, the new technologies and so on that we need, um, you know, that according, and maybe this, this I'll throw to you, Bas, first, but that according to the... European Union's own critical raw materials strategy. The Commission wants to propose wants to promote metal mining, whether it's cobalt, nickel, lithium, you, you know, within Europe, and with a special focus on coal mining regions and other regions in transition. 
I mean, how do we respond to to that? Because you know, mining can be a is a dirty business. I mean, we talked about emissions elsewhere. Uh, but on the other hand, we need those those metals. Yes, I see Milka wanting to come in, so we'll we'll bring her in first. You, you know, we need the metals for transition. Um, we also know that in some of these metals are to be found in parts of the world where there are real human rights abuses and great difficulties. So there's a strong argument in some ways for you know being more independent. So where does that that fit with the just transition agenda? Milka, you were indicating you wanted to come in on that. So I'll pass to you. Um, well, it, it's um, because I specifically want to uh, look at some of the environmental issues that are uh, connected specifically with open pit mining uh, and also with, uh, with shaft mining. Um, one of the major things we're fighting in regions like us is loss of water, um, which is caused by open pit mining. Um, and uh, the same goes for shaft mining. So uh, Poland is a region which is um, um, threatened uh, very seriously in the future by, um, uh, by drought, uh, by lack of water. Um, uh, it's um, pushing for further development of mining in such a region. Um, is counterproductive to the whole process that we're going through. So um, one of the most uh, important uh, stepping stones of the recent process that we had uh, here, for example, is that uh, two open uh, pit mines that had been planned uh, have officially been deemed uh, that they will not be opened within the next, uh, within the next um, uh, they won't be open, basically. We're going away, we're moving away from open pit mining. Uh, if we start opening the road for uh, the continuation of such practices in such areas, um, we are not solving the problem. We're solving the problem of uh, the energy plants, but we're not solving the uh, water-based uh, problems that we have in, in these regions. Um, in Poland specifically, this would be mainly Bohatów, which has the largest uh, uh, energy plants in the region and some of the largest um, um, coal mines, open pit coal mines. And my region, um, these are regions which have uh, climate connected um, uh, cli climate connected drought. So, Bas, did you want to pick up on that? that? You know, as so often, you're trying to solve one problem by maybe creating another. Yeah, that's, of course, the biggest uh, <clears throat> danger that we're seeing as well. I think this all shows, and, and, and Milka's uh, reply and example is, is very illus uh, illustrative for that, is that we really need, as a European Union, as a whole, really need to think of what do we mean by climate neutrality by 2050 and this transition. I mean, I really think too often people are just throwing in such a promise without really thinking through what it means. It is, it is, a, it is really a huge shift of our economy which I think is absolutely worthwhile to pursue, but it's, it's only a success if Europe as a whole is working in direction and we think strategically in all the different sectors uh, of our economy. This is not just about one sector, because indeed, if you don't do it correctly, then we are creating the problems that Milka explained. Then you're just replacing one open mind pit by another one. But that's not, not any solution, is it? So, uh, and of course, that's why also as part of this Green Deal, it's not only a climate agenda, it is also talking about circular economy, where we are using much more of the resources again and again. And the waste flows, minimizing the waste flows in order not to always go to um, prime core mines again to get our resources from. Uh, and, and this is part of that entire part uh, of that entire package. And, and Europe is also finally realizing that for that, you need a serious industrial strategy. 
I think 10 years ago, that was a terminology that Greens may have been using already, but was, of course, a taboo in the policies because, you know, we were in this liberal frame coming a bit from Thatcher, Gene, uh, where it is like, oh, sorry for that. <laughs> She's off. Um, no, so um, where, where the idea was, well, we, we don't need a big government, leave it to the private sector, they know better and they can do the changes and the government is, is not needed almost, right? I think we are finally coming back from that where we are realizing that if we do not have an active government thinking of a European industrial strategy, we will not get there, which is, of course, already a first problem. But secondly, as Europe, we will not work together in the same direction in order to really profit from it as an entire continent. And I think this just shows, this is just an, an example that shows how complicated, but also how challenging it is and how good it can be if we do it right. And that is, of course, the big if but we, we can still do it right. And I think, indeed, with a couple of more Greens in governments, probably it would, would, would be easier on top of that. Yeah, I mean, the more at the table moving in the, the same direction, you can do that. And, of course, I will add to the apologies for various governments. You know, I mean, the, yes, at least the, the UK, the, the European Union will now be able to yes, operate without um, the UK, but that is a personal pain. I leave this. But in terms of this, when we're looking at industries, you know, and regions where we really want to change one of the industries, coal or whatever, and we really want to do that in the way that is a just transition. Um, what are the key things that make it a just transition? I mean, Simona, you were talking about being left out by government, but at the, the, the level of where you're trying to shift an industry and go through a just transition, what are the necessary things to make that work? you think? Yes. I think that uh, there are some things that uh, are uh, necessary to, to do a just transition. First of all, uh, we need the participation because when you have to change um, the life in a, in a region, here, economic and social life in a region, you have to engage also the community, trade union, uh, local authorities, uh, researcher, all the, um, all the people that lives in this area would be engaged. Um, worker for, for first, uh, this is the first time. The other things is that uh, if you have to, to close some, uh, some activities or close or transform, deeply some activities, you have to create new job because uh, we cannot uh, say so to the people that uh, they have to lose their job without having another opportunity. So for example, uh, we in Italy, we are to face the uh, phase out of coal in 2025. So we have five years. We have to planning what do you want to do when you close these plants and uh, you have to build new activity, new opportunity, new job, and to use this time to, uh, uh, to create the new skill and training for worker. And uh, you have to have um, social safety net, uh, universal social safety net, and uh, also lifelong learning for all job because they have to prepare to the new um, uh, new skill that are requested in a different kind of uh, economy. But uh, um, this is not the situation. We are not planning what are the future. And uh, often the, the only um, solution that uh, 
we are on the table for the coal plant closer is a, a, a gas plant. So another fossil fuel, um, another fossil fuel plant. This is not decarbonization. This is not what uh, we want. But sometimes this is all, the only real opportunity for the workers. So this uh, would be also a contradiction uh, within the, the trade union movement because uh, uh, work, the worker see the the, the only um, the only real uh, change is another plant, a fossil fuel plant. So this would be not the the. the the situation we want that uh, we use the, the, the money that uh, we have uh, in this uh, time to create new sustainable job. So there are a lot of uh, things, a lot of job that uh, we can create. We know well that uh, in a sustainable uh, model, uh, there are a lot of job more than when the, the, the job that we lose in this uh, unsustainable system, but we have to ensure to worker that that new job are in the same region and the, at the same time they don't want to uh, live for for hope or for dream. They want to to have their income for for them and for their family. And I mean, it, it's a big package, isn't it, to to deliver? Um, and so, I mean, if you're looking at this as a as a government, um, yeah, but you know, I mean, it, it was one of the things that Jersey raised very much in his um, video was this question about trust. You know, that people need to to trust the authorities, to trust the government, that they will de deliver. So, you know, and if that's not happening, it's not surprising if workers fight for the jobs that they already have, because change is, is worrying. So, you know, what do you think might be done to narrow that, that close, that trust divide? as it were, between the workers and the communities and the government and saying to them, come on, you, you need to change. You, you ask to me, Jim? No, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, what, I mean, does, does the Belgian, your minister have plans? Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, on how the government there might develop that sort of trust. And, you know, then we can use the ideas this is yes well in order to make the 30 that you turn we can we can learn from what was called reconversion in the 80s and the 90s we think so in Belgium national sectors like coal mines I think a lot of uh, regions in Europe um, so shipbuilding glass packaging textile industry the steel industry was transformed and we converted into uh, another two other economic actors. Um, so, our example if you give sectors like a decade to transform to meet the objectives, you, you set up a reconversion fund that helps reskilling workers towards jobs in the new in industries, uh, the new industries like renewable energy and circular economy. So, in short, you are anticipating what what comes so you can convince existing workforce that this is good for them as well and build on their strengths. Um, however, we do need allies, as we all know. We need to work um, closely with the different uh, trade unions. So they. I'm losing my, my questions a bit, but, you, you know, within that, I mean, one of the, the questions that has come in, which I, I think I'm going to have to throw to you, Buzz, um, is about, you know, that we've talked about the European Union trying to accelerate this within the EU. What about, 
you know, the neighborhood, for example, the Western Balkans, that, you know, those other places that if we're, we're looking at this as a global initiative, will also need change and, and assistance. I mean, you know, what, what might be done there? I know it's not necessarily your, the area that you, geographically that you link with, but that, that neighborhood question. No, absolutely. I mean, um, it's a very good question, I would say, because um, when we are talking about a Green Deal and a transition of our economy, we do this, hopefully, that the entire world will do this transition, right? Uh, I think, I mean, in Europe, we are well positioned in order to maybe do the first steps and, and, and probably make some mistakes where others can learn from, let's put it that way. Uh, but of course, in the end, this, this, this is a challenge and this is an agenda for our global society. This is at the core of the sustainable development goals that the UN uh, has formulated, rightfully so. And indeed, I would say Europe has a specific responsibility also in its neighborhood policy, uh, certainly to those countries who we would like to see as part of the EU. So where we are or already in accession talks, or at least discussing whether we should open this uh, uh, um, accession talks. Uh, for example, uh, now very concretely on the table for North Macedonia, where again, another country is now blocking it. Finally, that we have solved the name issue and then Bulgaria steps in for pure national reasons, um, and which is already, again, not a very good uh, signal you give to those uh, regions of, of uh, our neighborhood, I would say. Um, but we, we tend to forget a bit, and that is a bit of a danger, what I see with the European Union, is that we are getting, well, not nationalistic, because it's at least a continent, but how do you call it? Continentalistic? I don't know how to call it, but that you are kind of, okay, we as Europe should solve it. We saw that very much in the budget negotiations. Um, what was cut was, of course, the money going to outside the EU because we are we're so fighting over the money within the EU. And I think these are really not good signals that we are giving as a European Union. And we should not forget that this challenge is for everywhere. Can I just jump to a couple of the issues that you, that, that you raised before? Because I wanted to jump in. Because I think when you are talking about how can we really ensure that, that these elements we're talking about are now really reaching the people, right? And not get stuck somewhere uh, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a government's level, whatever level that may be. Uh, and also talking about trust. I think in Europe, we do have two major problems here that are not so easy to solve, but I think you need to throw them in in order to, to see a bit the broader issue. The first of all is, of course, Europe is too much oriented along national member states. And if you talk about trust, and I think Milka mentioned it already, there is so much more happening at the regional level. And this is true for each country in the European Union, even also for smaller countries. But it is there is a lot of movement. There's a lot of change going on at the regional level. At the national level, it's quite often very polarized and stuck at political, for politicized reasons. And, and we have this problem in all our countries. And as long as Europe, Brussels, only negotiates with the national capitals, we have a big problem. This is also, by the way, why this rule of law debate is so crucial linked to the budget, because that might give a way out where we are not only getting stuck through the national level, uh, where the regions are suffering from. Uh, but that's a debate for the next session, I know. But, but this is so heavily linked to each other. Talking about trust, also this just transition money, if we want to have it landed at the right place, maybe Europe should not only discuss with the capitals. We probably are doing it very wrongly there. So that's, that's, that's one big issue that I see. And the second one is, of course, also when we were talking and Simona was talking about it, how to uh, how to make sure that that the people profit from it and that this is this is really a just transition of course bear in mind that that a just transition fund how big it will be can never ever replace the real financial flows that are needed for making a more equal society and for that we have taxation and as long as taxation 
is purely nationally oriented and nationally organized, you will see that governments are competing for each other to get companies to their country. So the tax levels on the big corporates are going down. We see that in entire Europe. And then, of course, the reaction of national governments is to tax other th things, which is quite often consumption or labor. So where the people immediately suffer from. And this is this uneven distribution in our society is even strengthened as long as we don't look at a complete overhaul of how we are taxing things. And we should not forget that element. I know it's not part of this discussion, but we should not forget that because otherwise we think we can solve with a just transition. But a just transition fund of 10, 20, 30, 40 billion euros is, of course, nothing compared to what we can redistribute through taxation. And for the moment, we are not charging the companies and more charging the people. And there is, of course, the real problem of a non-just transition, as long as we don't fix that problem. And no fund can correct that. Like, Simona, can I maybe ask you to comment on that? About, we're talking with the just transition about what we want to do. What are some of the things we should stop doing or do differently? I mean, you know, there's the tax issues that Bas has raised. Um, the, you know, did you want to comment? Yes, yes, uh, of course. Uh, uh, fiscal reform is uh, really important. Uh, we are asking for, for this in Italy. Uh, we have... Uh, I don't know in English um, uh, what is the, the words for um, evasion, I think. Uh, we have a thousand of uh, um, billion euros of uh, evasion every year. Uh, we have no uh, real progressivity of uh, the taxes. So this is uh, all our request. At the same time, uh, we have to do a an environmental oriented uh, fiscal reform because uh, we have to tax more uh, uh, the, the products uh, in base of the carbon uh, print uh, and uh, also of uh, the environmental pollution. And we have uh, in Italy uh, 19 um, uh, billion. Um, I think uh, I, I, I am difficult with the, the number in English, but we have a lot of we spend a lot of money for uh, fossil fuel subside and environmental harmful subside. So we have to cut this money and uh, to use this money for uh, reconversion of the economy. So uh, there are a lot of things that uh, we have to be, keep all together, but uh, I agree that uh, uh, we have to have in mind social aspect, uh, social justice, at the, at the same time, uh, environmental and climate action. We have to keep it all together and also human rights and uh, all the SDGs uh, goal we have to to, to 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 face so this is really important yeah. yeah i mean one another question that's come in has been links to what you were just saying about um you, you know the subsidies and the imports but i um, know that bas will have a comment on this and milka wave if you have but the question is, you know, about what Greens can do about the way in which the EU, as it were, imports emissions from outside and, you know, and then maybe the exports of waste to neighbouring countries or the global south and where that fits with in that wider view of just transition that you were talking about. No, absolutely. Uh, key question, of course, because indeed sometimes the Europeans are, are claiming very proudly that, that our footprint is, is, is declining, so we're doing a great job, isn't it? And then we forget to tell that, that basically we are importing products from all over the world and, and, and we forget to count that for our uh, footprint. 
Now, I think, and, and quite often, by the way, with European companies all over the world and in, 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 in deep with their hands into it, I would say. Now, and I think here, uh, and this is also one of the, the, the key agendas that we are putting forward as Greens and quite some colleagues are working on that as well at the same time. And hopefully, we now get some signals that the Commission is picking that up as well is to, of course, look at the responsibility of the companies throughout the entire production chain. And not only as Europe, uh, clean up your own backyards and making sure that the production within Europe is clean, but that the companies who are doing that and the products we are importing, that throughout this entire chain, the companies are taking their responsibility and we also expect them to do so. Eh? And that's then the call to due diligence in the terminology, but it just basically means that throughout the entire production chain, the company should clean up and not only when they have their production situated here. And I think that is, um, that is a crucial element. Plus, of course, as I said, a more fundamental discussion about the industrial agenda that Europe needs to have, which, of course, for a very long while was just let it go, let the, let the companies go to the places where it's the cheapest, uh, both environmentally speaking as labor uh, cost speaking. So more thinking of a, a dedicated European production is one part and there where you import due diligence and this responsibility throughout the chain. And that green agenda is really the over, overarching principles as well, because otherwise, again, we are only cleaning up our own backyard and that is far insufficient for a world that needs to be climate neutral in a couple of decades. Within the um, the issues that that have been raised with this, is the the issue that there are some parts of government that still don't really understand what this transition is about. That I think Yerge made the point as well that in his area, some of the trades unions were also not fully engaged in just transition. Um, the, you know, we're asked, are we asking people to make a change that many actually don't really understand? You know, so I think my question would be, as, are we as a society ready for the changes that we need? And how can we help make that a deeper understanding. Milka, do you want to come in on, on that first? And I'll ask all the panelists because we're moving to the end. Yes, definitely. I would like to uh, discuss this issue because this is something I've been thinking uh, a lot about. Um, so one of the one of the things is is that um, uh, these changes are happening very fast. Uh, so two years ago in my region there was no talk of uh, a coal phase out. At the moment uh, we're uh, we're at the forefront in Poland, at least uh, of uh, moving towards climate neutrality, of talking about uh, coal phase out, of closing down open pit mines, um, and uh, you will have a lot of variety of of reactions. Um, at the same time, you have to remember that in places like this, um, these have been places that have been going downhill for 30 years. Um, uh, there has been restructurization of the, uh, of the coal industries and the energy plants. There have been less and less people um, uh, employed here. So in a way, uh, what is happening now is also a chance for such regions. Um, one of the things that, uh, going back to the trust issue, um, Transparency is extremely important in transparency of the decision making process. This is something that is um, that is lacking also because it's uh, at the moment it's very complicated uh, because we don't know if the decisions will be made at the regional level, at the national level or at the European level and which decisions will be made which. Um, and another is uh, that for greenwashing purposes, uh, sometimes the whole process is a little bit blurred. Um, so that we on the ground don't really know who is making the decisions and how the funds will be um, uh, divided. This creates mistrust in the whole change process. Um, so 
Um, it's obvious that people who will be losing their jobs um, are worried. They don't know what the direction is. So we need to be starting making um, regionally, nationally, on a European level, a clearer message. Uh, but I think first we need to figure out by ourselves where exactly and how we are heading. Um, and um, uh, the, the trust issue that was brought up here in, uh, a number of, of times is extremely important, but also really difficult. Um, in the political framework that we're working in, because most uh, political parties think short term, uh, one election to the next election. They also think in terms of big investments that are flashy. Um, in the type of transformation that we need now, it's not about being flashy. It's about a whole lot of very complicated small changes, like uh, Simona mentioned, um, in agriculture, in how we look at water, in how we look at um, industry, in um, taking a different stance on the economy, in introducing real circular economy, um, and also avoiding greenwashing. So um, for a perfect example of that, I mean, in my region, they've been talking about uh, funding or um, helping along the local incineration plants um, uh, through the just transition process without understanding that this is not part of circular economy. This is not something that should be uh, planned on the long term. But again, it's a flashy investment um, uh, that they're trying to sell as green. Uh, these are specific issues um, that um, the, the message gets lost along the way. I would also say that definitely regional and national governments are not prepared in such countries as Poland. Um, so when I come forward and I talk about progressive green ideas, um, this is completely new to them. At the same time, they are learning really fast. Um, there is a completely different approach at right now. So a year ago, I was talking to local governments about uh, adaptation and mitigation, climate uh, adaptation and mitigation plans, and they had no idea what I was talking about. Now they're introducing it. Um, uh, so at the beginning, um, these the, I think the process has sped up. Uh, the process of change has sped up and the process of raising awareness has sped, sped, sped up. Uh, because people are more aware, because in Poland, uh, a lot more people believe in climate change than they used to a number of years ago. And a lot more of the um, voters are also pushing for a more serious approach to climate. So um, I would say there is a message of hope in this, uh, that these changes are speeding up. Uh, I still think it's not fast enough, of course, because as Greens, we know how fast we should be moving. Um, but uh, I still think it's a huge, huge change in comparison to even five uh, and specifically and, and especially 10 years ago. This is months. You, within months, you see huge changes. Um, and I think that's it from here. I would like to say I, I, I always keep up the, the hope message because um, I can see these changes happening here. So <laughs> that's Wow. I mean, that that's really good to hear is, you know, something that that change is speeding up. I mean, Simona, do you think that there is a real understanding of the changes that needs to be made? And what what can trades unions do to help develop that understanding? I thank you, Milka, for the hope message because I'm not so positive <laughs> as Milka is. But uh, yes, I think that um, the society and trade union with the society is uh, ready to the change. But uh, the problem is the time. We have no time. And uh, I saw the political decision, but also entrepreneur and uh, media and uh, uh, instruction institution are not uh, in line with the, the, the few time that uh, we have uh, at the disposal. And uh, also people are awareness about the change we have to face, but uh, I don't know how many people are disposal to change uh, their style of life. So. We have in mind that uh, the other have to change, but uh, I don't know how many of us uh, want to reduce their consume or uh, go 
uh, by foot and not by car or eat less uh, meat and uh, so on. So I think uh, is a very hard change that uh, we have to face. And uh, I think the, the we like uh, we as CGL we are working hard uh, to enforce our alliances. We work uh, together with the environmental association, with the social movement, with the Fridays for Future movement. We we try to to keep all together the 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 the, 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 the reality that are engaged on uh, social justice, uh, climate justice, uh, and environmental um, protection to to to. to to force the the changement, but uh, is is really hard because there is a, there is a long process and uh, we have not all this time disposal to for us. So I I have I say that if I would uh, give a message, uh, work more together, and uh, maybe <laughs> we can do. Excellent and. Um, from the, the point of view, um, you know, from the Belgian government, you, you know, what's the feeling there that does society really understand this need for change? Well, we think society still, if you call it society, still needs to learn that there are a lot of trends that can turn easily into a crisis if we don't anticipate them. And we, unfortunately, we witnessed the pandemic, we, we witnessed COVID that has been announced by research institutes and public agency for at least 10 years ago and more. So um, we really have to be aware that all planetary boundaries can even in short term can be exceeded and turned into crisis. That's the first. Secondly, um, Minister Katabi Sazakia really thinks politicians need to show more leadership uh, in, in Belgium, for example, but I think in a lot of countries, political parties don't have the guts to, to make unpopular decisions. Um, so they need to show leadership and not, not only show leadership, they also need to explain to people with science as an ally, science-based, uh, why people have to do things and how they can do it. And so um, taking civil, civil participation into account at all levels of government. Um, so that's what uh, Minister Katabi is working for and she strongly believes in. And I must say we are also optimistic. It's not because we are green parties that uh, being optimistic shouldn't be a moral duty for us as well. On this note, I thank you. Thank you very much. And Bas, um, is being optimistic part of a moral duty for a green politician then? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think in the end, yes. Yeah, I know we are known for always complaining and saying it's not enough. But I think in the end, yes, there, there must also always be also a message of hope and optimism in it, as long as it's not uh, too naive, right? But yes, optimism is, in, is important because the only way to uh, realize change is by by inviting people to do that. And uh, most of the time, people do not get invited for change if you, if you scare them, to be very honest, or, or just say that it's all over anyhow. So then, then maybe they will not feel that need to, to change. Um, maybe just on your question, right? Um, is the society ready? I think more than ever, uh, maybe that is, fits this, uh, uh, this message of hope. But, I mean, the problem is not in the society. If you look for support for policies that are, you know, more going into the green orientation, it's huge. People do know something needs to change. And I think uh, the video where we started with, by, with Jersey just shows it because probably people have the feeling, well, a mine worker will never agree to change. Of course they do. And you see that in all the sectors... There are not so many farmers happy in the current agriculture system they function in, but they are forced to. So there's a lot of change willingness, but I think there is a couple of very clear conditions we need to comply with in order to make that, that support for change also really happen. The first, of, the first one is it needs to be fair. 
people need to feel that when they want to change, that everyone is going along and that it's in a fair way. If you have the feeling that the big company who you are breathing, it's polluted air every day, doesn't need to pay for it, and you then have to pay for it as an individual, then you don't feel that the change is fair and you will obstruct and you will resist. So fairness is so crucial. Secondly, people need to be involved. I mean, we are not in the old political model anymore where a politician tells you, you do this and we just expect everyone is doing it. The modern society expects that politicians are honest, are explaining, are also expressing where they're not 100% sure yet. There is doubt. We are changing, which is massive. We can't have all the answers either. People want to be taken seriously. And quite often the political level is still treating our citizens as they were doing that 50 years ago. Come on, politicians, the world has changed. Our society has changed. And the third one is, of course, don't underestimate the level of resistance by the vested interest. We are going away from a fossil economy to a new economy, and there is a huge vested interest in the fossil economy. So any politician that just thinks that by doing a nice speech here and there, and then people will understand where we're going to, and then getting all the lobby against it, you're not, don't be naive, and people will feel it. Because that brings it back to the first point. If you then listen too much to the lobbyist, it will not be fair because you are just excluding some of the sectors that sh should change the first, maybe. So this kind of this vested interest and that political fight, don't underestimate. And that is probably in the end also our challenge of green politicians, labor unions, etc., is to fight for that change. Don't be naive. Go against the vested interest. But also very important, take the people along, make it fair, but most important, take them serious. Probably then we can do it. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Virtual applause for our, our panel. I think they've done a brilliant job this afternoon. Thank you all so much. And I want to thank all those as well who put questions in for this session and all of you that have shown interest, as well as, of course, all the staff that have worked so hard on putting it together. So to come back a bit to the introduction, um, you, you know, to Jesse's introduction that to reach the goals that we want, it's not only about the money and making sure it goes to the right places, but it's about the process of that change, that the trust has to be earned and that people are willing to change if the conditions are right, if they see things are fair, that they're transparent, that they are taken seriously. And so, as you say, that for those of us that are working for change, we have to ensure we really do make this a just transition, a fair transition, and not just change because those at the top are saying so. So thank you all very much for that. Let's say another round of virtual applause there. Thank you so much. And I will now hand you back to our host, Francesca, who I think will tell us what is happening next. So thank you all so much. And, you know, we'll see each other in real life at some point soon, I hope. Thank you. Thank you. Well, an applause from all of us here, which we can't give you in, in real time, unfortunately. But uh, thank you, of course, uh, Jean Lambert and the panelists uh, for the very interesting discussion on the challenges of the implementation of a just transition and how important it is that nobody is left behind. It won't be easy, but discussions like these contribute to a thorough uh, public debate and hopefully also better policy. I know it has already been a very intense day with a lot of input. Uh, there's a lot to absorb uh, on a day like this, but I do hope all of you that you will join us for the last uh, plenary session, which starts at half past uh, six. Evelyn Hertebroek will moderate the discussion on the rule of law crisis within the European Union. 
But before I let you go for a short break, I'd like to remind you there will be a second group picture taken at uh, 6.15, just in about 10 minutes, more or less. Um, it's uh, for the media campaign, social media campaign on abortion rights in Poland. And the only thing that you need to have is a black top and um, uh, a red lightning sign written on your hand or a piece of paper, whatever you choose. Uh, join us in the dedicated Zoom room, which you can find in the agenda on the left-hand side of the this uh, platform and it would also be very nice to take a selfie afterwards and post it on your socials. All right, we meet again at uh, 6.30 and don't forget to tune in at 6.15 for the group picture. Thank you.